So, good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Klein. I'm the director of P20 Initiatives, and we're very excited to have you with us. We've got a great panel today, um, really diverse, um, the pun fully intended because it's, it's an accurate statement, to really help us address our topic today, which is equity in practice connecting learners with their schools and colleges and universities. And so again, as we always try and do, we're taking a look at this across both the early childhood through 12th grade and the post-secondary settings and going to consider a range of issues. And so we've got a great panel today, two high school students and one post-secondary leader to talk about these issues and really help us focus our attention on what all of us as educators and leaders need to be doing to take action in these areas. And we're excited to have you joining us live. We will be posting this video uh, for, so it's it's shareable with everybody in their busy schedules. But those of you that are here right now have the advantage of being able to interact and ask questions and so forth. So I'm going to have our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, Jocelyn, I'm gonna start with you. If you can tell us who you are and what you do and where, and then we'll move on to our high school students. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, or hello, everyone. <laughs> um, so my name is Jocelyn Santana. I am the Director for Social Justice Education at Northern Illinois University, and uh, Jason and I are colleagues. So um, thanks for having me here. So we're really glad to have Jocelyn. I have had the opportunity to learn from Jocelyn and her teammates as a student and as a learner and be a part of communities of practice that they set up and uh, some really cutting edge work going on with that team. And so we're excited to have Jocelyn here to share that team's collective knowledge. And now uh, we've got two high school students who I'll have each introduce themselves. Uh, Cherry, will you go ahead and start? Hi there, uh, I'm Cherry Gudamunla. I'm a senior at Palatine High School and um, I'm glad to be here today, thank you. And Sam? Hi, my name's Sam from Palatine High School, a senior in Palatine High School. I'm really happy you guys have me here today. Um, Cherry and Sam, I'm gonna kick off with you guys. Can you tell us, just get us started by telling us one thing. It's obviously been such an unusual high school experience that you've had with the shutdown occurring uh, in spring a couple of years ago and then last year in and out of school and now this year back in school with our masks on, but things going pretty, pretty normally with activities. What's one thing you really like about school? It could be a class, an activity, a teacher, whatever you want. Cherry, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, one thing I think I definitely missed during the pandemic and quarantine school and online school was the sense of community. I think the second that we got back into the year and in person, even with the masks and the different regulations, it was just the people that I missed hanging out with and having a sense of um community and having a teacher to go to and having friends and students and peers to help me and etc. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Sam? Adding on to what Cherry said, um, one thing I really miss so much is socializing with my, you know, my football teammates, my wrestling team, my teachers, especially. I really miss the teachers. You know, I miss like, because I'm a, I'm a visual learner. And I need to be there. I can't just stay on Zoom and just watch people teach. I need to be there in person. And it's just really great to really be back and, you know, learn and be a part of this great community, like Cherry said. All right, we're going to stick with our high school students for just a second. What, what do you think students in general want teachers and professors to know about what makes you feel most included or comfortable in a, in a school or in a classroom environment? Um, I feel like one thing where when, when compared to like Zoom school is this, even when a teacher <laughs> we're during our passing period, so forgive me if you hear any noises. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so feeling included and comfortable in the classroom isn't always just like calling on a student and participation. It's also having the opportunities that we didn't get to have during the pandemic, which have looked like like um, going in for help and having a sense of tutoring and like asking questions without feeling awkward and et cetera. So I think um, how to feel the most included is just to make sure that your students are 
one, getting the most out of their opportunities. And it's not just staying in the classroom, but that those opportunities uh, expand outside of the classroom as well. Yeah, Pam? I didn't know. In my opinion, um, I think every student needs um, different amount of attention. Some people need more attention than others. And, you know, if you're a student really needing that attention and you just feel like excluded from the class, no one is asking you any questions, you know, you're too awkward, you're too socially awkward to raise your hand and ask a question and you don't feel like you're learning, you know, I feel like it might be very difficult for them. You know, I think teachers should go up to the students and ask, you know, let's talk to them, get to know them. It's really important to get to know your student because, you know, once you can talk one-on-one, -on -one, you get to know how they learn. Maybe they're visual learners. Maybe, maybe they can learn on their own. You know, some people could easily, like, for example, in my math class, some people easily, you know, could learn everything about calculus, you know, all the rules and everything. And me, I'm just here. I, I need special attention. I need to, you know, <laughs> learn, learn and learn again. And, you know, I need more explanation than others. And it's just great if the teachers could, um, you know, you know, like engage with us and get to know us better as individuals. So let's let's stick with that. <clears throat> what are some of the ways that you feel like teachers best get to know you better as individuals? Think of an example of a of a teacher who does that, and tell us what that looks like and feels like, or what that shouldn't look like and shouldn't feel like. Um, I think first, like establishing that personal relationship with your students is really important. And what that could look like is, well, just recently, um, my math teacher, Ms. Considine here, she's known for being very personable and um, the people, her students around her, we love her very much. And because she's in an empath where like, when it comes to assignments or a tough schedule or something, she works with us and she makes sure that we have we don't miss out on any opportunities, even though we might not be able to get them in the classroom during a specific time. Or when we're just having a bad day, just making sure to like check up on us. She's one of those teachers that if you do not always have a smile on your face, she notices the second that something's off, which I think is so, so cool and awesome. And we just kind of, because of that, our whole class uh, last week wrote her letters and surprised her with it and just to show a, like a token of appreciation and uh, she really loved it, we really loved it. So yeah, just creating those personal relationships and not being afraid to um, make a mistake with your students because your students are human just like you, teachers are human just like students. And so we understand like if anything, we're teenagers. So we understand when we make mistakes, it's not gonna be perfect 100% of the time. Um, but if you're willing to work with us, we're willing to work with you. Definitely. And in my, in my case, you know, from my perspective, I would say, you know, activities and just, you know, presenting yourself. Some people don't like presenting or, you know, saying anything about themselves, but, you know, at least asking, how was your weekend? What are you doing this weekend? You know, you know, to just to know their schedule, just to know their time, you know, are they working? Do they have work, family issues and all of these things? And you get to know them better. And I feel like those activities and those questions, little questions, you know, little things you might not even like notice. Like people, some people might not might not notice. We students notice it. We know like, oh, this teacher cares about me. She cares about what I'm doing this weekend, and you know, my plan, my schedule, and she actually really wants to get to know me. So that's really exciting. There was a lot of great information there for us to unpack as educators. Those were really, really detailed answers. Thank you, guys. Jocelyn, I, I know you're just listening to those uh, answers with the rest of us, but as you think about those and think about what, our, what your team um, does both formally through workshops and programs and, and informally, in consulting and conversation, what resonated there? What are the things that you really wanna pull out of that that align with, um, with what the team does um, at NIU? Yep, thank you. Um, I would probably say, well, fantastic. Um, I appreciate those very thoughtful answers that you all provided. I think that that's great. And I think that that's important for us as educators to hear. Um, and so there's a lot of authenticity in those responses. I think a lot of what we have focused on in our education, for example, um, 
we went into the Calp School District um, and worked for eight weeks with a group of selected individuals that I think they were self-selected, if I remember that correctly. Um, individuals, educators, psychologists, administrators, principals, right? Um, the scope of um, educators for a school district. And we worked on social justice education and competency. A lot of what we talked about was thinking about how we work towards creating inclusive environments for our student populations or for their student populations, um, which included looking at not just race, but also looking at all the other isms that may be um, in fact or other identities, gender, sexual orientation, um, ability, you know, access along those lines, I think are very uh, relevant and important topics when we're talking about inclusion, because inclusion really is also um, creating and, and working towards that sense of belonging for our student populations. And, and um, even for ourselves as professionals, right? Because we got to model that as well. So that's a lot of what our education and our training has been actually with educators um, in the K through 12 settings, but also within higher education is to look at, okay, what does this look like and how can we be equitable in our distributions for our resources? Um, I think that that's an important understanding. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you, you've just shared, a couple, a couple of things I want to call it, and they probably go in different directions, Jocelyn, but number one, you talked about the authenticity of the answers we just heard from, from Cherry and from Sam. And I, I want to, I'm interested in hearing more about the importance of authenticity and how, how your team approaches helping faculty, staff, um, educators when you're, when you're working at the K-12 setting be appropriate and authentic and, and use that as a way of getting at um, issues of inclusion or, or becoming more inclusive. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, so there's the Institute of Belonging um, and actually there is a public um, link uh, when uh, Dr. Uh, John Powell came in and spoke in DeKalb. Um, and so this Institute of Belonging shares a framework or a model that talks about the human circle and how it's important for us to um, come into spaces and recognize our humanities. And it's funny because we actually had a, um, we had a uh, professional development session with maybe 20, 30 folks yesterday, and we were talking about specifically um, authenticity and belonging and, and how that feeds into inclusion, right? Um, but a lot of this also has to be unpacked and unlearned as professionals as well um, for us to model these um, these vulnerabilities um, appropriately, right? Um, vulnerabilities with um, our students, but we have to also be comfortable ourselves in taking that step and modeling that with each other um, as professionals to professionals. And so once we start um, recognizing our own humanity um, and bringing that to our spaces with us, you know, I think that that's an important first step, not just for our students that are observing us, but also for ourselves in that healing and um, inclusion practice. And so again, this, this if you get an opportunity, take a look at that, that framework or that model of, of um, the human circle. Um, they have really great resources around it, but, but that's really starts to foster this authenticity um, that we're talking about. I think also other approaches in authenticity happen when there's an approach on shared power, shared uh, responsibility, shared leadership. Um, you know, when we, uh, when, when that power is shared with students, um, when there are common standards that are set um, within classrooms that guide conversations in the spaces so that students can come and show themselves the most authentically as possible. All of that starts feeding into this building of an inclusive community. That's awesome. Um, we'll come back to that concept of shared power in just a minute. Um, and for all three of our panelists, we're going to go way off script when we do that, but hitting on some really, really important instructional issues that I know are um, relevant to lots of people in our live audience and are relevant to, the, to a lot of the instructional work that the Illinois P20 Network does. Uh, Jocelyn, one more question for you right now. I wanna go back to, uh, you talked about the work we need to do ourselves as professionals, um, whether I'm a first grade teacher, a seventh grade teacher, community college professor, a 
higher ed faculty or staff member, a four-year university faculty or staff member, what advice would you give leaders in any of those organizations about how to, how to take the right steps and, and not misstep, um, but to create safe spaces for those conversations to happen productively and also to, to lead to action. Um, and so tell us about, I know that's a big area of the work of your team is helping people move through that. So walk us through maybe some, uh, offering us some, some guide rails uh, to help, help us get there as leaders in a way that's positive, as positive as possible for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So here's, here's um, you know, it's important that there is uh, self-reflection and I think honesty with ourselves as um, people, right? Because um, oftentimes in the work that I do with, when, when it deals with cultural competence or developing competencies, social justice education, um, you know, sense of belonging, inclusion, all of these concepts, there's always this, um, mm, there's this line that exists of, um, well, I'm not those individuals. I'm not that individual that has those extreme perspectives or extreme views that are exclusionary. And so sometimes it can be very challenging to see yourself as a um, contributor to sustaining systems of inequity um, or, um, you know, participating in it some way, shape, or form. And I think that that's, that's really difficult sometimes to grasp because it may go against our own values, beliefs, norms, attitudes that we hold for ourselves that we think we have, right? And I, and I often times when I talk about this, I think it's really important to approach this from um, a place of um, understanding and grace for ourselves. And that's this humanity piece, right? You know, I, I often have to do this work for myself, you know, and, and think about what beliefs I hold, what values I hold, and and where that stops and others have that right to also have their beliefs, values, and, and for those beliefs and values to be respected. And so um, where I often share with folks is for individuals to start with that self-awareness to understand yourself, understand how you have been socialized, not only as an individual, but also socialized as a professional. We have both socializations that exist, right? Um, uh, you were exposed in your, um, you know, bachelor's, master's, whatever level of degree education you have um, to philosophies, beliefs. Um, and, you know, in time, there's the, those philosophies and, and beliefs have evolved and changed to be more uh conscious and aware. Um, but I think, you know, starting with your self-awareness, so what what uh, beliefs do you hold and how they, those beliefs can show up in the classroom, show up in your engagement with students is really important. I often like to share a story, and I'm not trying to go too long here, Jason, but I like to share a story. Um, and it, I think that this is really interesting. Um, so, you know, when I talk about identities, I identify as Latina, I identify as a mom, um, you know, a social justice advocate. Um, I have my Christian belief. Jocelyn has frozen up. Uh, we'll see if she can come back. Um, so we can hear the rest of that story. Well, we wouldn't all be together if it weren't for the technology. Um, so thank goodness for the technology, but as we can see, it's not perfect yet. So when Jocelyn comes back, we'll let her dive into that. One of the things that Jocelyn talked about was extending grace and allowing people going through the process to be human. And um, one of the things I've seen in my own experiences personally and with people around me is, is, um, is allowing yourself to, to drop your level of, of almost self-defensiveness um, and to be able to say, yeah, I make these mistakes, even though I believe in diversity and inclusion and equity and the, the rights of all individuals and the power of all people, all of my students to be successful. Um, there are still things I'm doing for a variety of reasons that are, are inhibiting uh, those beliefs from, from coming to fruition. And so we heard Cherry talk about that a little bit before, uh, earlier when she was talking about 
um, teachers when they make a mistake saying, hey, I made a mistake here. And that can be really powerful. I want to go back to Cherry and Sam right now. And um, I, I want you to, I don't want you to name names here. That's for sure. Um, but can you think of a time, and, and if you can't, I suppose that that's a great indicator of, of how things are in your school, but can you think of a time where um, either an individual teacher or a school-wide program um, has taken place where, that, where you knew the goal was equity and inclusion, um, but it, it didn't really connect? with you, it, it felt a little artificial or it, it may have even actually made you uncomfortable and had the opposite effect of what you knew it was trying to do. Have you, have you experienced that? And if so, can you tell us about what that was like, what happened, what it was? Because I think that also helps us know how to avoid those things. And I see Jocelyn's coming back in. So we'll, we'll come back to Jocelyn in just a minute for, for that important story. But Sam, Cherry, go ahead and if you can tell us about if you've experienced one of those well-intentioned mistakes on the part of a, of a teacher or a system. Sam, you wanna start? I'm still gathering my thoughts. <laughs> Sorry, that was a okay, little so. That's okay. Um, I just wanted to point out, I, I can't think of something like a, a situation right now, but I just wanted to point out, um, you know, as humans, we're constantly learning and, you know, the teachers can't be perfect all the time when we need them to be perfect. And I think a lot of students need to understand that, you know, we're not asking, we're just asking them to do their best, you know, do the little things like, you know, learn about us and all that. But, you know, over time, it's like, we need you to be better and learn actually. But, you know, we're all, we're all human beings and, you know, eventually we make mistakes, but I don't think, I don't personally, I don't put, um, I don't put my teachers to such expectations that, oh, you need to be perfect. Like you can't make any mistakes all the time because, you know, I can reason with them like, oh, you know, you can make mistakes. That's OK. But personally, there hasn't been a lot of situation in Palatine High School that I, I think I wasn't involved, like, you know, that anything was wrong or, you know, that or it didn't feel natural. Or it didn't feel I just feel I just felt ex excluded. I don't think I've ever experienced any of that in Palatine High School. Great. Cherry? Yeah, to kind of go off what Sam said, like, thankfully, in my last four years, I haven't had many, like, experiences like that with teachers. Um, but last year of 2020, I worked with our district's equity team, and that was a mix of students, faculty members, parents, and um, other district board members. And they all had their own experiences. And what I think I could we could really pull from that is like, it's not always, the effect isn't always gonna stay in the school. It always somehow leads outside of the classroom and it impacts our students and it impacts just their, their, their personal lives, their relationships, their families. And even though it's, it could be something minuscule, even for like a minute or something, a comment, a look or a tease or a joke that um, is very surface level at the time could build up and eventually lead to like more of a personal experience that students don't expect and eventually parents don't expect too, families and it goes into their professional lives too. It carries how people put um, work in like into their passions and their goals and I think that's super important. Um, I do have more like um, positive experiences and more helpful experiences. But yeah, that's my answer to that question. Just to add on to that, um, you know, our teachers are expected to be professionals, and, you know, to make the least mistake they can. I think I experienced this more amongst students and this unfairness more amongst my fellow students than my teachers, because my teachers, you know, they always try to learn, they, but this fellow students, they, I don't, a lot of people really don't care or they just don't want to learn or, you know, yeah, I don't really experience this among my teachers, so shout out to them. <laughs> so let's come back to your peers, but, but before I do that, I want to point out um, two things that have been a theme now in, in what Sam said, and, and we've heard them in, in Cherry's comments as well, and I think, I think Jocelyn's talked about them as well. One is 
um, is, is we're not going to be perfect. Um, and Sam's telling us, on, at least in, from his perspective, that students will show uh, teachers at all levels grace for that process. So that's, that's really great to hear. But then on the flip side of that, there should be this trend of, of getting better over, over time as well. And the second thing that we heard is that uh, is about getting to know us as individuals, is getting to know one another as individuals. And that's really interesting because um, I once worked in a place where they, and this was, <laughs> this was a long time ago, and, and the big buzzword at that time was multiculturalism, was, was what we talked about in, in ways that today we talk we use the phrase diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of the things that multiculturalism tended to slide into was a focus on, on food and holidays. And, and, and those are all very important things. There's no question um, from the day-to-day -day of what we're eating to the ritual of important, important holidays over a year or, or events in a lifetime. Um, but one of the things that was brought up in, in those conversations that really stuck with me and that I thus far in my career have always found to be true is this quote, family ex culture exists at the family level. And this is why you can have good friends of the same broad culture and linguistic background as you, but you, you go to their house for, uh, I, I use the, the uh, very secular example of Thanksgiving and you'll, you'll go to the house, someone's house for Thanksgiving who has a similar background to you and you'll be like, why do you guys do this? Why are you eating this? And because those, those differences can be rooted um, not just in macro cultures, but really the microculture that exists at the family level. And so um, without getting to know people as individuals, that um, becomes impossible to really understand. Now on the flip side, whether you're talking to a high school teacher with 165 students a day, or you're talking to a, a college faculty member who might be teaching a class of 165 or more in a lecture setting, um, yeah, that there may be some some challenges there. But to the degree we can, <clears throat> excuse me, get to know people as individuals, I think those are important points that I brought out. Jocelyn, I would like to bop back to you if you can to tell us that story, and then we'll come back to Cherry and, and Sam to talk about your peers, because um, that's come up and, and I think that's helpful for all of us to hear. So Jocelyn, can you, can you give us another shot? We were hearing about how the different ways you identified, and the last one we heard was, was Christian, and then unfortunately the technology did its thing. Yes, yeah, so hopefully I will stick around this time, um, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> Um, so, um, so exploring your identities and the self-awareness piece is really important. And one of the things I often um, talk about is in these self-awareness moments. So a couple of years ago when the Women's March um, happened, when it originally happened, um, I had grabbed my kids and I said, okay, we're going to go um, to this Women's March. We made posters. They were um, there. I had a conversation with them on why we're participating. And, you know, I use the power of social media to show and go Facebook Live. And all of a sudden people are looking at all of my um, interactions that's happening. And um, all these posts are coming up. And particularly, um, the posts weren't affirming posts. <laughs> they were more like, I can't believe you're there. Um, I can't believe you're supporting this cause. You clearly do not value human life. Um, and so it was really interesting to be in that intersection and decide how I wanted to respond or, or, or not respond. And I decided I was going to go ahead and respond. Um, rather than taking a um, very hard perspective on it, I uh, chose to infuse a little bit of humor and, and, and get a point across at the same time. And so I said, oh, you're right. Clearly, I do not value human life here. This is what we're talking about here. Um, so why don't you go ahead and come and grab my kids? What was I thinking? And um, that was enough of that moment for individuals in my feed and my network to pause and consider what it is that they were thinking, what it is that they were saying. And so, so I thought that that was um, interesting. 
Um, and those are interesting moments of self-awareness, right? It doesn't always have to be this, this large um, conversation. It could be exposure and then uh, reflecting on what it is that you are having your own reactions to as you are engaging in something. Yeah, I had a, a moment like that. Um, I, I've been lucky enough to visit the homes of students for, for decades. And after doing that for, I don't know, almost well, about 20 years at the time this happened, um, I went with a colleague to a student's home and it was late on a Friday night. It was about eight o'clock at night and we were sitting in the family's kitchen and, um, and, and I was offered a bottle of water and I said, oh, you know, very politely. And this whole conversation was taking place in Spanish. I said, no, thank you, I'm, I'm fine. And uh, when we walked out, my colleague reminded me everything went well, the conversation went well, the purpose of the visit was successful. Um, I would go on to continue to have a relationship with the family. Um, but my colleague reminded me <laughs> before we were in the car um, that, that that was potentially offensive um, to have not, not taken that, that bottle of water I was offered in their kitchen. I was in their home and, and they wanted to give me that. And um, for someone who, who, who it, it was a, a good moment of self-reflection. It seems so minor, right? Um, but I think to Jocelyn's point, these little moments, I mean, here I am, this is four or five years later and I can, I can feel the moment and smell the moment and picture the moment. And it's these little moments that can continue to build up and, and we have to be open to those moments. And then to Sam's point, we have to be open to acting differently in those moments, but we also have to know individuals to not take, not take a lesson and, and over stereotype it. And so I guess, Jocelyn, how do you help people as they are learning and particularly people who have spent most of their lives um, with people more like themselves in many ways who are, who are now maybe starting to interact with more and more different people and who are engaging in these kind of conversations how do, how do you help them along in that process? What are some of the initial steps so that those initial steps can be positive for them as a learner, as an adult learner, as, a, you know, as an educator, um, so that they wanna keep moving down the road? And so uh, like Sam and Cherry have said, so they don't feel like they're always doing something wrong. Um, even if their students aren't expecting them to always do it right, they may be expecting themselves to always do it right. And, um, what are kind of the steps you take to, to help learners in this space? Because I think that's important for the people on this call for how we, how we present these topics when we are engaging with, with colleagues and staff. Yeah, so uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so a couple of points here. Um, first is understanding that we need to dismantle the human hierarchy, okay? And I think that this is a really important conversation um, because, you know, I often start with the question, you know, when is it okay to oppress somebody? And I'm not, again, I'm not talking about intentionality here, although sometimes that can happen, but I'm also talking about those unconscious moments where we are oppressing somebody or using our position or using our power to be oppressive. And I think that that's an important moment of reflection. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's doing a lot of self-reflection on, again, what values you hold and what beliefs you hold. You know, um, I've done training where folks are like, oh yeah, I'm here to dismantle racism. I'm here to dismantle sexism. I'm good with that. Oh, LGBTQ? Oh no. I'm, I, you know, I, I, I don't go there. I, you know, I, I can't support that. That's against my belief system. And so evaluating this human hierarchy and dismantling it is really an important part in doing this work. And so that's the first step is being able to look at yourself and understanding what values you hold. And if there are values that can be oppressive in nature, how is it that you evaluate that? And sometimes those things are very difficult to identify because we start going into our unconscious bias areas. Um, and, and it's those ideas or thoughts um, that may come up to your in the back of your head that you may not necessarily vocalize, but they're there. 
And so spending time in those thoughts when they do um, pop up or writing them is really important. Um, that's the authenticity of working on yourself. Um, the other aspect too is understanding or as you're working towards cultural competency for yourself is understanding that there is a broad, um, there is a fantastic model called the cultural competence continuum. It's an older model back in the 80s, I think it was um, created, but I still use it. I find it to be very, very relevant um, to today. And in this cultural competence continuum model, um, it speaks on um, culturally destructiveness, in, incapacity, um, evasiveness, uh, pre-competence, competence, and proficiency. And the, the beauty of this model is that at any point in time, you can work or be in the transformational side of this model, which is the pre-competence to proficiency in one particular area. But as you are moving through the system or, or well, two things, moving through yourself um, in this continuum and identifying things, you can identify that, oh, maybe over here, I may be operating at the destructive level and I need to maybe address that. So it's a student that comes up to you and maybe is having a conversation about um, uh, a, a matter and your response is, yeah, we're not going to address that. That's not, you know, what is the policy here? Rather than taking a perspective of looking at the student, identifying with empathy, and then being able to identify, okay, is this a student issue or is this a policy practice um, institutional, you know, school issue, right? And so the continuum works in two ways. One, it works for you as an individual, but it also works for you to evaluate the system. So your education, your school, um, your district, and being able to look at, okay, are there policies or practices that are existing that are creating inequitable um, avenues or experiences for our students. And so, again, I think that those are some of the, the ways that we look at, at things um, to, to start maybe impacting change. You know, um, obviously microaggressions is uh, one of those kind of areas or, or spaces for conversations. Well, when it comes to microaggressions, oftentimes there's this understanding of, well, it's subtle slights and insults, but, you know, it's not really in your face there are different types or forms of microaggressions and within those different types or forms, I think it's important to understand them to be able to do appropriate interventions. So are we dealing with a micro assault, which is the most um, in your face? And I think in time, in these last couple of years, we're seeing more micro assaults happen. Um, and so that will inform the strategy and the intervention, you know, versus micro insults, which are the smaller slights of, you know, oh, you know, you are very pretty for, or, you know, you speak very well for, you know, those types of insults, right? That requires a different strategy and an intervention. And then you have micro invalidations. And micro invalidations are one of those examples if you're interacting with someone and they say, you know, I feel like I, I'm being treated unfairly in this class. I feel like I'm being graded um, more harshly or whatever it is. And the invalidation comes in. Are you sure? Is that really what's going on or, is, or are you just interpreting that that way? Um, again, those are moments where it's not necessarily intentional um, by an individual, but that reinforces harm, that reinforces pain. Folks that have been historically marginalized um, or have um, identities that are marginalized, um, they recognize patterns. You know, and so taking that step and opportunity to, to empathize and to be able to maybe work through that rather than just automatically shifting, well, the policy is this, or well, the practice is this, or well, no, I don't, I know that person. I don't think that that, that person would be treating you that way. Um, I think that those are important um, avenues. So as you can see, there's a lot of different ways that you can engage um, with this, um, but I think it's a matter of making the decision as to being conscious of those unconscious moments. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit here, and I've got a question for all of you. I'm gonna start with our high school students on this one, because a lot of this work um, to solve this problem that I'm about to bring up is taking place in high schools. We, we talked on our last panel about the teacher shortage, which is truly a P20 issue. Um, we have teacher shortages at all levels, and the only way we'll solve the teacher shortage 
is, is with the involvement of, of K-12 or early childhood through 12th grade um, and post-secondary together. So one of the things we wanna do is not only solve the teacher shortage and ensure we have the very best teachers possible, but we also want to ensure that our, our teacher candidates uh, reflect who their students are in as many different ways as possible. So what ideas do, do the three of you have? And starting with um, Cherry and, and Sam, what ideas do you have to best increase the diversity of the, the teacher candidate pool when we think about um, traditional current high school and college students um, to help us help us match the tremendous diversity of the people of Illinois. And then Jocelyn will have you jump in. And obviously, if, if there's ideas from the audience on this topic, which affects everybody uh, in this group uh, today, that would be great. So Cherry, Sam, how can we how can we increase the diversity of our of our teacher candidates? Um, well, first, I think like, in all honesty, like, uh, it's a give it like a personal level. This year, we have a lot of new teachers in our school, or at least not teachers, but um, TAs and like faculty and assistant principals. And um, we have like, I want to share one of my um, black friends, he was so excited because we finally have our first like, black assistant principal. And he's just like, wait, Mr. Smith is black? I didn't know that. That's so cool. And it's like little things like that that I just wanted to bring out because it's such an important thing to have. And um, to reiterate the question is, um, I think like when looking at pools like this, us students, we don't really get to have a say in who gets to be hired, right? But I think now when it comes to backgrounds and culture, the newer generations like the millennials and like a little older than that and little younger people who are just now graduating college or getting their degree come from a lot more backgrounds than normal because for example like in Asian culture you don't see a lot of Asian teachers because they either are forced to go into fields that are stereotypical or fields that don't really work with people as often whereas it's like whether it's educators whether it's Psych psychiatrists, therapists, etc. So maybe diving into like more younger generations and looking for people from different backgrounds and um, comparing the diversity of your school to your faculty. Like, do those two things match? Do they, um, is the ratio equal? Like, if um, a person is more inclined to have a, per uh, a counselor or a teacher with a similar background to them, do they have that opportunity? Do they have that ability to ask specifically, like, can I have this teacher for this class? Because I know they teach this. And um, I think they could really help me, not just within the classroom and curriculum wise, but um, we could really match on a personal level, which also helps with the prior topics that we talked about. So that's my thinking there. Um, on my side, I have two points. I would say number one, Teachers should be better teachers and, you know, nicer. And like I said, you know, little things um, towards, especially students of color. I think they need more um, attention and because a lot of people have been through different traumas at home and, you know, they don't really get the opportunities like everyone gets. And if you become better teachers, you know, people want to emulate, you know, um, what they see, the good things they see in you. People would like to emulate. I, you know, if I see a good teacher that, like, I really like what she does, I would want to be more like her. And, you know, a lot of the teachers we have here, the younger teachers love, love, they love their teachers in the past. And they're like, you know what, I want to be more like them. And, you know, a lot, a lot of young people are teachers right now. Like one of my coaches, he just started teaching. He went to this school. He's a math teacher. He said he loved his math teacher. So he wanted to be more like him. And he became a math teacher to help others. Like he was helped. He was helped. Um, his teacher really helped him. So he really wanted to have, help others and give back. And number two is just create more opportunities for the students, you know what I mean? And uh, just create more opportunities, you know, college, you know, college is expensive and people need more scholarship, especially people of color, because they feel like, what if I go to college, I don't get a job. I don't get a good enough job because I'm black or this or that. And I can't pay my college loan back because college is a huge risk to people of color, you know, 
high risk, high reward, you know, you get to let them take the risk and give them higher reward for that, you know. So that's my opinion. I also wanted to add, like, if possible, bring in people of different backgrounds of experience. So people who have worked in colleges and universities that um, are of color or are like of similar experience to high school students where they can come in and they have a place at the high school where they have the ability to give those said students similar opportunities that could help them in the future as far as their career, as far as what goals they want to accomplish and um, diversity training, not just within the faculty and teachers, but um, put, put the students along with it, just like how um, I was part of the equity team here. I feel like a lot of help and um, uh, goals can be accomplished if that were to be adopted, not just in um, the district, but in like minuscule amount where it's like in the high schools, in the classrooms and have more meetings like this with um, teachers and uh, potential teachers. Aslan, what are your thoughts about everything you just heard and how we solve this, this teacher huh? shortage that we're in uh, across the state? My gosh, my head is like, just, I, I mean, just in this subject matter, I, we can spend an hour or two. Um, I want to um, come back and recognize the students that just shared right now, um, because I think what you are sharing is so important and so, so important to be validated and heard. And um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you're touching on a very, very important subject, which is representation and the value and the impact of representation um, and what historically has happened. And I think it's really interesting when we start talking about um, education and, um, and our students' experiences, particularly students of color. Um, you know, it, it's so important for us not to ahistoricize what has happened within our educational system um, with the move of segregation into um, inclusion and what that happened with the population of teachers that existed um, historically with uh, teachers of color in particular that weren't that lost opportunities to move into the educational pipeline and here we are today right? So we have to give space for that historical element um, because that's how we start understanding where this representation may, may or may not be lacking here. Um, you know, and so, so it's really important, I think, um, that as students are demonstrating interest or demonstrating um, potential skills that, you know, um, show that they may be interested in the field of education, it's important for that to one, be recognized and two, to be cultivated, right? We talk about this in the higher ed setting when our, when our individuals, when students are in our classrooms and we're seeing the potential of a career path how is it that we are engaging with those students in the classroom? How is it that we are encouraging them in that, in that path and exposing them? You know, I remember having a conversation um, in one of my previous roles. So I used to work in career services and um, a sophomore came into the space and was, was talking to me and saying, you know, I really don't know what to do. I don't know how to engage. I don't really know my career path. Um, and we just had this really great conversation. And I said at that moment, do you want to be an intern in my office? And they were like, what? And I said, yeah, would you like to, to interview? I'm interviewing. I said, would you like to interview and see if you would be a candidate for being an intern in my office? And, um, and this, and this individual was talking about maybe pursuing like higher education no, not at the time they weren't. They didn't even consider higher education as a profession. And, and then I exposed them and I started talking to them. He said, you understand that this is a field, right? This is a, an area of study. We can, you can get your master's degree in two years and, and um, go into higher education. 
oh, what? And so it's that awareness, that exposure, that conversation, that investment, that cultivating that brings our students back into these spaces. And I think that that's an important conversation to have. I think impact in how that is done is also really important. We're, we see in the national media what's happening with conversations uh, with critical race theory and how that is being pushed back on or the rewriting of our history <laughs> um, or decolonizing colonizing our educational experiences and curriculum so that there is uh, more representation other than how, how maybe folks of color um, have been represented within our history, you know? Um, and so those are, are some points of conversation that I think have long-term impact. If you're an administrator, you know, it's how we are approaching where we are posting our job, our job descriptions. How are we reaching out? Are there avenues? You know, in higher education, there are there are um, uh, job uh, search engine sites that are specifically for folks of color. You know, um, so there's a lot. There needs to be a lot of intentionality behind the cultivating of um, individuals into the higher into our education. Uh, roles, and then there's uh, intentionality behind how we are recruiting and attracting diverse candidates into our, our areas of work, and then how you support them once they get there. So I'm going to do just a quick tie back to something that was said earlier uh, by Jocelyn and something that the students have alluded to and an advertisement for the last panel of our, of our fall meeting next, next Friday morning which is focused on career pathways. And obviously the career pathways work is tied to this, but at the core of all of the instructional work that we do uh, out of the Center for P20 Engagement, so both through the Illinois P20 Network as well as through NIU STEAM is the notion of authentic learning. And Jocelyn brought up earlier the, the phrase shared power and shared power should look like a whole bunch of different things in the classroom, including what instruction looks like. I mean, mm -hmm. one, of, one of my favorite uh, uh, educational professors of, of days gone by uh, is the late Seymour Saracen and Seymour Saracen really spoke to this, but also spoke to how, how, um, how principals and teachers interact and how students and teachers interact. There's, there's parallels there. And we know the best schools are schools where, where teachers are empowered to be part of the decision-making processes. And at higher ed, it tends to be formalized through, um, through all kinds of shared governance processes, but really in, within the classroom, it's important too. And we'll see that in next week's Career Pathways work and a lot of the really advanced Career Pathways work that's taking place across the state. And there's been a, a fair amount of money that's been devoted to it too, has been focusing on human and public services and the education pathway. So with that, to wrap us up, one, one last question for each of you, and, and this is a hard one because you, you may repeat something you've already said, you may want to say 50 things because, of course, there is no shortage of things for us to do. But if there was just one thing you could change um, about schools, colleges, and universities generally, so like Cherry and Sam, uh, I think the teachers and administrators at Palatine High School that have been working consistently on this work over many years are going to be pleased to hear your answers to know that that while there's probably still work to do, they've made, made great progress as a result of the time and energy they put in. So we're not talking specifically about, about your school, um, but about schools generally. What would be the one thing that each of the three of you would suggest uh, a school, college, or university, or an organization uh, that's represented on uh, watching this could do to become more inclusive? Jocelyn, you want to kick us off? So what can uh, institutions or education what's systems a, what's do? What's one do more? thing that yeah, an organization or institution can do to, to become more inclusive? I think uh, look at the policies and practices to see where there could be inequitable um, practices that won't recognize differences of the students. I think that that exists. Um, and so those differences, you know, aren't just race, right? Those differences are intersectional. And so thinking about how we practice um, our education is an important process in that um, inclusion efforts. Jerry? 
Um, one thing I would try, to, I would definitely say is figure out a way to decrease the amount of apathy from students and from the university is because you can't, if everyone thinks that there's nothing to be changed, then there's nothing to be done because it come, it's not just the ignorance, it's also the sense of, well, nothing's happened to me specifically, nothing's happened to them, so like, I don't see a problem. Just because there isn't, you can't specifically see a problem doesn't mean there is one. And so I think try to increase the amount of empathy from your faculty, from your um, college is a great start to beginning a solution, to beginning um, how to increase inclusivity. Because if people don't care, then like you're not gonna get anything done, right? So that's one thing. And um, I had another thing, but I forgot. <laughs> it's okay, that's a great one thing. Sam? Finish this up. What one thing could could organizations do to be more inclusive? I think um, listening. I know it's this is very like cliche, you know. Listen to your students. This, but I don't. I think we it's underrated how much that actually helps the teachers, and that almost that could help because I feel like the the solution to a lot of problems is in the voice of the students. They need to speak. They need to you know communicate with you, and you need to listen to them. You know, one thing is to speak and communicate and see all the problems they have and how you can help them to fix it. And the other thing is taking action and, you know, planning. And that's the hard part, you know, action and planning and bringing stuff together. And, you know, individuals might have differences, you know, and, but, you know, you can't always cater to what everybody wants. You know, you really can't satisfy everyone, but, you know, trying your best to reach that and, accepting differences, accepting different cultures, different this, you know, just listening to them. Like, this is what I want. This is what I need. And really giving it to them and taking action, especially, especially take action, most important. And, and Jason, I'm going to jump in here to reinforce that point um, and reinforce what we talked about earlier. So there's a, there's a, a, a matrix called the oppression model or oppression matrix. And within that oppression matrix, one of those things that get evaluated is at the, at the individual societal institutional levels, attitudes, beliefs, norms, um, values, right? And so when there's a point that's being made about listening to students and, and bringing them and including them into the process, like that's an effective inclusion strategy. The, the, un, the side that impacts it is, is the dismissive or the oppress, oppressive part comes in when it's saying, oh, you just wait, you think that that's a problem now. That's really not a problem, you know, and, and dismissing those thoughts. That's where you can see hierarchical of human, human value or oppression come in when, when youth are dismiss because of that of age right um and experience but that's really not not may not even be on the table or should not even be on the table um and so i would encourage us to have that self-awareness so and as an action-oriented point i will throw out something specific that i think ties this together for organizations at all levels and cherry brought it up um but that's that's to include students um and faculty, if you're if you're not including them in places already, but in hiring processes, um, that is that is something that is actually easily done. Um, if people have questions about that offline, um, I'm happy to discuss what I've done with that in my own career. Um, and as I've got some hiring to do, uh, we have some conversations to probably rehab about maybe reconsidering uh, exactly what our processes look for those positions. Um, so that we can make sure um, we're we're putting our putting our feet to the fire on it, if you will. So there's that's just one specific example of a way to to try and put something into practice. And obviously, listening would be a, a critical part of having students as part of those processes. So with that, there is so much ground that we could have covered that we didn't. We never got back to even talking about peers which would have been so interesting for all of us to hear about. I wanna first thank our panelists, um, Jocelyn, Cherry, Sam, thank you so much. Hopefully you guys are seeing the thank yous in the comments. Your voices were heard and will continue to be heard loudly by lots of people as we share this out. Um, thank you to those of you who attended today. If you have 
feedback from me, you are welcome to reach out to me uh, directly at either my email address or P2I network at niu.edu. And I would welcome your, your feedback on either next steps or things that I or we can do better moving forward. And I would just remind everybody that we have one more, um, one more panel next week with two school districts implementing the career pathways work, one that's uh, probably the most experienced district with it in the state at this point, and um, the, the other that's in the process of implementing right now, and we'll have some students earning endorsements uh, this spring, hopefully. And so join us next Friday morning at nine for that. Cherry, Sam, Jocelyn, thank you all again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for having me.